Good evening and welcome. Uh, I want to begin tonight with a passage of scripture that I'm sure is familiar to most of you here. And I want this passage, however, though, to linger on your mind, if you don't mind, throughout the lesson tonight. It's a passage that comes from the Hebrew letter. And in Hebrews chapter 11 and in verses 13 to 16, what we find about all these great men and women of faith that are recorded here in this powerful chapter is that they all had something in common. Clearly, they all had faith. But I want you to notice what the Hebrew writer says about the faith of each and every one of them. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and they were exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. I know tonight as I speak to you, I'm speaking to people who are looking for a city. And you, just like all these men and women of great faith that are listed in, in Hebrews chapter 11, you as well have that same longing. That's what we all have in common. This world may be filled with a lot of personalities, a lot of different viewpoints, a lot of friction, a lot of conflict. But isn't it great to come together and be surrounded by so many who have this same goal. When this all started about 17 years ago, and that when COVID started about 17 years ago, I couldn't help, but I'm sure just like you was going, I can't believe this is going on. I can't believe that we've just shut down the world and it was just me and Cheryl and the dog and a son who didn't want to be there. He wanted to be at school. And that's always fun when your children come home and they don't want to be there. I couldn't believe this was happening. And then it was just a few months later that all of a sudden you had all this social unrest, all this conflict. And once again, I'm going, I can't believe this is happening. And then it's a political year. That I can believe is happening. <laughs> but it just seems so worse. And I remember thinking to myself, you'll have to forgive me. Maybe this is all my fault. Could this get any worse? <laughs> and then there was an earthquake in North Carolina. I mean, it wasn't an earthquake in some fault line where you were to expect it. There was an earthquake in North Carolina. And then there were fires. And then there was the idea of many who were going without food. And, and, and things just kept building one after another. And then there was this. Locusts. Did you know that right now in Africa, in nations like Kenya, they're dealing with locusts. And even the news reports describe them as biblical proportions. Locusts. There is one swarm of locusts that is said to be the size of three times the size of New York City. I want you to imagine a swarm of locusts that goes all the way from Clearwater all the way past Orlando, and it's all over Brandon and Valrico. Can you imagine? I hadn't even thought about that. But when that, when that hit the news, I couldn't help but think, oh my, we've gone back to the Bible and specifically the book of Amos. 
Did you know Amos mentions an earthquake? Amos mentions fires and Amos mentions locusts. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Amos. If we're going to live in a life that is filled with great pestilence, we might as well look back in history and see what it's like to live with one wave after another of one great disaster, one great disaster, one great challenge after another. Now, Amos, let's just real quick, just throw it out there about Amos. Amos really doesn't get a lot of love. Can, can we be honest about that? I mean, when was the last time you went, whoa, I'm really wanting to study the book of Amos. You know, Hosea has a great love story. Jonah has a great fish story. You know, you go over into Haggai and, 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 and others, and at least they're talking about rebuilding things. And, but, but Amos has Amos. And more often than not, when we go and we look at the story of Amos, Amos is a, well, it's a lot of sermons that are just fire and brimstone. You know, I noticed you got the blue lights going around here. That is so cool. If you've got the red lights, let's throw them up now. See, it's fire and brimstone night if we're going to study Amos, all right? But nobody wants to go study Amos because Amos is just one big fiery sermon after another. What's interesting about Amos is just you consider his name. His name means burden bearer. But here's the deal. He's not necessarily carrying his own burden. You, you see, he, he is a sheep herder. And if you go back and look at the beginning of it, he, he's the one who seems to be fairly proficient in the fig business. He knows figs. And God has called him out of the southern kingdom in a little place known as Tekoa and has called him to go preach to the northern kingdom. And here's the worst part about it. <laughs> the worst thing for any preacher to have to do is to follow a great preacher. I really wasn't that worried about coming to Valrico. But in some places, it's really bad. For Amos, he had to follow Elijah and Elisha. How would you like to be the next guy up after those guys? And they were able to perform miracles. Amos is not going to have one miracle in his pocket. There, there is nothing in his story, there's nothing in what he presents that everybody would go, whoa, hey, show us that again. Yeah. No, Amos just brings the hammer. And he's not even a preacher. It's not something that he's longed to do his whole life and to be a man of God and, and, and to serve in that fashion. He, he's just a sheep herder. And yet God has called him to not only preach, but preach in a place that is not his home. Let me repeat that again just so you got that. The Lord has called him to preach in a place that is not his home. Let's consider his audience. If you're in the book of Amos, uh, go, to, go to chapter 5 and in verse 18. Here's the first thing you notice about his audience. His audience are those who consider that everybody else deserves judgment, but not them. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? In other words, they're the kind of individual who goes, you know what? I sure can't wait for God to bring it upon them. I tell you, those folks deserve it. If the Lord will just bring it and bring it now, boy, that'll be great. And they never look in the mirror and assume that maybe, maybe that judgment would also include them. If you go to chapter 6 and in verse 1, you see why they act this way. Because they're filled with so much prosperity in their life. Here's what's interesting. If you go to the southern kingdom where Amos is from, and they, quote, had the good king at that time. In fact, in the days of Amos in the southern kingdom, there was a revival taking place. Uh, if you remember your kids' class when you were kids and all the faces of the kings around the bulletin, remember those? The southern kingdom had a smiley face king. The northern kingdom had a frowny face. It was Jehoshaphat II. But here was the catch. The northern kingdom was prospering. We often think, well, just because they had a bad king, they must have been suffering. No, 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 no. 
God allowed them to prosper. And here's what they're saying to themselves. They're at ease on Zion and they're at ease and feeling secure in Samaria. And in verse 4, he says, woe to those. Woe to those, Amos 6, 4. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory, eating lambs from the flock and calves in the stall. In other words, they were a people that had plenty. And here's the deal. Even Often in the pestilence, they had plenty. Prosperity. Being blessed should humble us, right? I mean, our first thought when we're prospering and have much and and realize the Lord has been good to us, the first thought for us would be, who can I share this with? Not these folks. They had beds of ivory. So prosperity did not lead to humility. So what does God decide to do? Well, God decides to bring the pestilence. And so here comes the pestilence in Amos 4 and in verse 7. You'll notice that there is no rain. Therefore, God says, I withheld the rain from you. When there were yet but three months to the harvest, I would send rain on one city and send no rain to another city. One field would have rain and on the field in which it did not rain, it would wither. So two or three cities would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied. And notice what he says, yet you did not return to me. Verse 9, here's what he decides to do. God says, I struck you with blight and mildew. It's like they lived in Florida right there, you know. I actually got a letter from the Homeowners Association just the other day about my driveway is all dirty and stained. My son's coming home in a few days. We'll correct that. (laughs) Don't tell him. So I struck you with blight and mildew. Your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locust devoured. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Uh, Verse 10, I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword. I carried away your horses. I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils. Yet you did not return to me. Verse 11, I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and you were a brand plucked out of the burning. Yet you did not return to me. You know, you would think after a while when there's one challenge, one challenge, one challenge after another, things that you can't explain, that you've never endured before, keep coming upon you. You would think that after a while, these people would humble themselves and seek the Lord, but it never happens. And so here's, here's what Amos preaches to them in verse 12. Prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. Now, can you imagine being commissioned with that sermon? Hosea is talking all about love, and, and he's, he's living it out in his life. Granted, it's a heartbroken relationship, but boy, it shows the mercy and the kindness of God. Jonah is going to encourage people to repent, even though he was a pathetic preacher and didn't really put his heart into it. But he's going to go and reach out to a nation that is immediately going to fall all over itself and turn back to God. But Amos, Amos is going to go and preach the sermon to the people at ease and even the people who are struggling in the pestilence. And they're not going to turn to God, so he says, prepare to meet your God. You know, often when you kind of look at the book of Amos, and maybe one of the reasons we don't study it a lot is nobody really likes to hear this kind of preaching. And generally, especially in our society today, we don't like anything that implies that maybe somebody else is judging us in any way. I mean, how many times have you heard that? Say, you, you, you don't judge me. 
You're, you're too judgmental. Well, why are you like that? But here's what I'd like for you to consider, though, with Amos, when we look a little bit closer at his sermons. Is, is, is Amos judgmental? Or is he actually merciful? I know that sounds kind of odd when you're commissioned to preach these kind of sermons. But go to chapter 7. Amos chapter 7. This is not Amos speaking to the people. This is Amos speaking with the Lord. Amos 7 verse 1. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And they had finished eating the grass of them. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O oh Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, says the Lord. Verse 4, this is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire. And it devoured the great deep, and it was eating up the land. Then I said, oh, Lord God, please cease. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, says the Lord God. Do you ever see Amos as a Moses? Standing in the gap between God and the disobedient, wicked people? Did you ever see Amos like a Christ who was willing to stand between himself and the Lord? Well, he was. He was. Even when God was showing him these visions, even when God was just simply going to keep his word, you find Amos willing to stand in the gap. Uh, a little bit later, the vision's going to go to a plumb line. And then in chapter 8, you're going to find the vision of, of rotten fruit. You know, just like sometimes we have, anybody here ever left a little, uh, uh, an apple or a banana on the counter too long, you know? And it may still look a little okay on the outside, but you know on the inside, you don't want it. It's what the people looked like. And ultimately what you find is this in Amos 8 verses 11 and 12. Here was the true famine in the land. It wasn't a famine of bread. It wasn't a famine due to thirst and a need for water. But it was a famine from hearing the words of the Lord. They'll wander from the east to the sea to sea, from north to east. They'll run to and fro, and they'll seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. But yet Amos is there trying. Amos is there preaching. Amos is there pleading. Amos is there standing in the gap. So you tell me, make your own judgment. Judgmental or merciful? You see, really what you see when you consider the attitude and the actions of Amos is that in many ways he mirrors the character of God and even the character of God is seen in this great story. Is God merciful just only in the story of Hosea and not in the story of Amos? Is this a proclamation of judgment that is eliminating any form of mercy, grace, and love? You know, just like Paul says in Romans chapter 2, behold the goodness, but also behold the severity of God. He is, yes, he is rich in great wrath, but he is also rich even more so in great mercy. And what does he long for? He longs for the people to repent. Look at all the warnings. You have eight chapters of warnings, eight chapters of pleading, eight chapters of the Lord's sermons in word and in the nature and in the calamities and the pestilence that is happening all around them. And what you see also is this in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, that the Lord will do nothing without revealing it to one of his prophets. 
In other words, even when the Lord is bringing the pestilence and the desire is to humble the people, the Lord is going to bring a messenger to plead with the people to turn back to God. I mentioned just a few moments ago that Amos follows Elijah and Elisha. Anybody remember what the Lord told Elijah when Elijah was extremely depressed and he had taken off and run to Mount Sinai and he was going, woe is me, I'm the only one. Woe is me, it's just me. Woe is me, I'm the only one who cares. Anybody remember what he told him? What did he tell him? He got 7,000 people back home. I know it's been a few years since Elijah was on the scene, but I know full well that even in the days of Elisha and even in the days of Amos who follows him, there were faithful people even in Israel. And so I want us as the people of God who are longing for a heavenly home tonight, I want us to consider, well, what is the Lord teaching us when we're in a pestilence? What is the Lord even reaching and teaching the faithful when we're dealing with things we've never dealt with before? This has been unprecedented, right? But you know what? This isn't the first time it's happened. It's the first time my generation has ever really been told no. And we don't care for it, to be honest with you. If you go back to my grandparents living in World War II and you go back to them, they lived at a time in which there was a lot of no. Uh, my, my grandmother would tell me about not being able to have a tricycle or a bicycle because there was rationing on rubber and things of that nature. There were things that you just couldn't do and you go back to their parents and you find that it was a time where there were great amounts of suffering due to great amounts of disease and we didn't have near the technology that we do today. But this is the first time for our generation to be told no and we don't like it. We're the people that want our internet and want it now. Why? I got to look at Facebook. You don't know what I've missed in the last two minutes. Or I've got to order something. What do you got to order? Oh, I got to order groceries because they're going to go get my groceries for them and they're going to bring them to my house because I don't want to have to go to the grocery store myself and get them because I'm too busy. And that's a great service, is it not? Man, that rocks. But what do you do when you find yourself in a pestilence? How do you live? Well, I want to leave you with four things, and all four of these things come from the book of Amos. Because I got to tell you, when I realized there was an earthquake and the fires and then the locusts, I went, oh my. Maybe the Lord's making a point. And maybe I need to listen and maybe I need to be careful that I might be on my own bed of ivory hoping God judges everybody else. So what's the first thing? What's the first thing that faithful do when they find themselves enduring or in need of endurance through a pestilence? Well, number one, we do what God wants us to do at all times. He longs for godly sorrow and repentance. Whether it's in prosperity or the pestilence, we should be quickly falling on our knees before the Lord. Now, go to Amos 5. This is probably, to me, the greatest verse in all the book. Now, we're going to get and see the theme in, in, in chapter 5 here in just a moment. But I want you to listen to what God longs for from the people. This is Amos 5 verse 24. He longs for justice. He longs for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like the ever flowing stream. What the Lord longs for is that from the land there will be righteousness, there will be mercy, there will be kindness and it will flow. It will flow like waterfalls all over the land. When you consider what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, it is the godly sorrow that leads to repentance. 
I tell you, if we haven't taken the time to fall on our knees and say, Lord, please forgive, then how are we any different from that Pharisee who went up to the temple to pray? And said, Lord, I'm sure glad I'm not like these other guys. But that's what we do as the righteous. We realize that everything that may be coming our way, whether it's prosperity or poverty, knocks us down on our knees. And so what we do is we seek to really get right with the Lord. In Amos 3 and in verse 3, you find this beautiful description of the way the Lord speaks to the idea of walking together. And, and, and more importantly, he, he says it like this, do two not walk together unless they are agreed to meet? In other words, do you have a desire to see things as I do, says the Lord? And maybe think for a moment that maybe your thinking is not the best thinking? <laughs> Many years ago, I had a, a guy come to me and he was all distraught because he, he, he found himself in a challenging relationship situation and, and a lot of the fight was over money. And, and I, I got to talking to him and I said, well, uh, what'd your financial advisor tell you? He goes, financial advisor? I don't, I don't need a financial advisor. And I said, well, didn't you say you have this much debt? Yeah. Didn't you say that you're running behind this much? Yeah. Didn't you say you're about to be, uh, you're about to lose your car? Yeah. Well, it sounds to me like you need a financial advisor. I said, I got just the guy and he'll meet you for free. And so he said, well, okay, I'll check it out. So I, I sent him to a fellow who was, who was a brother in the church who was just really good with money and, and, and is good about setting up plans. And, and, and so they went and met with Lee. And, and a couple of weeks later, he came back with his wife and they were sitting there with me. And I said, well, how did he go? How did you find from Lee? And they went, he doesn't really understand us. I'm like, what? I said, yeah, he doesn't really understand our situation. I was like, what's to understand? He said, well, he told us to sell this, and he told us to get rid of this, and he told us not to be buying this, and I said, what? Well, he, he doesn't understand what we need. I said, what's your plan? He goes, we'll think of something. I've never in all my life wanted to scream at somebody. Satan was telling me to go, what are you doing? But I calmly put on my preacher face. I smiled. And it was like the Holy Spirit was guiding my tongue. And I said, okay. But did it ever cross your mind it was your own thinking that got you into this mess? Why would your own thinking get you out? Just saying. But then I realized I had to eat those words not too many days later when my wife shared them with me <laughs> about something. We won't go there. But here's the point. When we talk about agreeing with the Lord, <laughs> The agreement comes from the Lord directing us, not us directing the Lord. How are two going to walk together unless they are agreed to meet? And so what you find, what you find when you get into the book of Amos, especially when you go over to chapter 5, is you really find what is the theme of the entire message from Amos. What does the Lord say in verse 4? Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go over and enter into Gilgal. Do not cross over to Beersheba. Gilgal will surely go into exile and Bethel shall come to nothing. In other words, don't be listening to the advice of other nations. Don't be listening to the advice of other people. Don't go and try to find out how to make money from a poor guy. 
Don't go and try how to run a successful business from a person that's failed over and over again. Don't seek marital advice from the person who's in the bad marriage situation. You listen to me. Verse 6, seek the Lord and live. Lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O oh, you who turn justice to wormwood, who cast down righteousness to the earth. Verse 14. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. I tell you one of the most powerful illustrations that you really find all through Scripture, even when you get to the New Testament in Colossians 3, is the idea of seeking the Lord's face you know what that looks like in the heart of a Christian that means even when we find ourselves in the pestilence we not only humble ourselves but we seek the will of the Lord I'll give you an example from scripture you know when you go over to the book of Acts after Stephen is martyred remember that story who took up the banner to start crucifying and going after Christians well Saul and it was on and the Christians were scattered and when they were scattered what did they do anybody remember Acts 8 they went everywhere what preaching the word they, they didn't all of a sudden form all these protests to go and revolt against the Jewish leaders and deal with this evil guy Saul although I'm sure if they had any kind of leveraging power they might have thought about it but it gets even more powerful when you get over to Acts chapter 11 and now the epicenter of Christianity is no longer in Jerusalem because of the persecution it's actually up in Antioch to the north and what happens when word comes to those in Antioch that there's now going to be a great famine in all the land? What do they immediately do, all these Christians? They say, you know what? There's some brethren down in Jerusalem we need to take care of. Let's go and raise money, pull money, and go feed them. Because when the faithful are in the pestilence, they immediately think, how can I use this to glorify God? This is an opportunity, not so much an obstacle. And here's why they think that way. Because when you look at the heart of the righteous, even in the pestilence, they realize and understand some things are just more important than others. Can anybody remember back to March? Remember March? Was anybody here like me going, Oh, I sure hope they don't cancel that. Oh, they'll cancel that. Oh, man, I can't go to this now. Oh, this trip got canceled. When camp got canceled, it got serious. I was not happy. But then again, it's just camp. It's just a trip. It was just a ball game. Some things are just more important than others. Some people started losing jobs. And what I found with those who even lost jobs or started losing money because things were cut back, there were so many who would say, but I still got my health. Because some things are just more important than others. And then there were those who lost their health. And unfortunately, I've known of many people who I've been very close to who had family members who were losing their health due to this horrible virus. But the powerful testimony from all those who were faithful was, but I still got the Lord. I'm still alive. Some things are more important than others. 
And then there were those who lost their lives. In fact, two nights ago, somebody very dear to us lost a sister to COVID-19. And the greater tra tragedy was this dear friend of ours unintentionally gave it to her sister. She had it first. And even in the tears, even in the pain, they were rejoicing. They were rejoicing for this sister who is now with the Lord because some things are just more important than others. You see, those that follow the Lord and trust in the Lord, who see eye to eye with the Lord and long for the Lord, they see the world differently. They don't see a bed of ivory as a place to relax and kick back and, and kick back with luxury and ease. No, they see an opportunity to use more to share. Just like the Lord was saying to Amos, Amos, being a shepherd's good. But I need you to represent me even in a land that is not your own because some things are more important than others. We were having to do a lot of virtual assemblies. Y'all have virtual assemblies? You like that? It's no fun talking to a camera, I'll just tell you. I crack a good joke and it just looks at me. It's like, hey, all right. But I was getting some of the other men to help me with this, and then I even reached out to some of our college students and I had one college student when I sent him a note, hey, would you mind doing the table talk for our He said, sure, absolutely, Mr. Phil. And, and then, you know, it came around to the time he's supposed to turn it in. I said, hey, how's it going? You were you going, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I forgot I had this going on. And what the deal was, he, he had a lot of homework to do to finish, but his family was also going out of town. And, and he really was packed. He said, no, 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 get it done, get it done. And boy, he sent it to me the next day, and it was fantastic. It was wonderful. And he texted me back. He said, hey, man, I, I'm so sorry. I, I, I guess next time I shouldn't overcommit, to which I said, whoa, wait a minute. You did a great job. But there's never, ever, ever going to be a point in your life when sharing the message, whether virtually or in real life, is going to be convenient. I'm proud of you for doing it anyhow. Keep that going. Because some things are just more important than others. And the final thing I would share with you is that right now when you're in a pestilence, the world needs more Amoses. It needs more who are willing to share the story, more who are willing to reach out and show the world that they're different, more who are willing to uphold righteousness and justice, more who are willing, who are willing to take the burden upon themselves to now use this as an opportunity and not an obstacle. And bear in mind, it was never easy for Amos. Not only was he in a land that was not his home, not only was he having to preach to people who were not his own people, what you find in Amos 5 and in verse 10, they didn't want to hear his message. Russ Bowman, probably a name that's familiar to many of you, wrote this quote of our current situation. The problem in our country and the problem in every country and the problem in every generation has nothing to do with politics or economics or health or race. Certainly such issues contribute to the unrest and difficulty in the world around us. The problem is a dismissal of God and therefore a dismissal of judgment. 
If you knew that you would stand before God and be judged by his will at the end of the day, would it change your behavior, your attitude, your priorities, your heart? I affirm it would, says Russ. And as we are living in a world that distances itself farther and farther from God, we are merely reaping the consequences. Unquote. I don't want you to think that I'm standing before you tonight saying, you know what? God's judging us. He's bringing COVID upon us. It's God doing it. I know he's doing it. And he's made all the social unrest. And he got us in this political mess. And he's making sure that we have a president who won't even leave office. And we're having people who are mad at one another and arguing with one another. And it's, it's God bringing judgment. I don't know if I can say that. But I can say this. When you look in the world around us and consider all the unrighteousness, and if you just simply look at the more than 60 million babies that have been aborted since Roe versus Wade was, in, Roe versus Wade was enacted, God has every reason to judge us if that's what he's choosing to do. So what do we need to do? We need to be in Amos. We need to be willing to go where it's not comfortable. We need to be willing to share the message that maybe doesn't want to be heard. We need to be willing to reach out to a world who, Lord willing, to some degree now, might be willing to listen. When this all really got bad back in June... It changed me in many ways. And it was back then when things were bad on so many levels. I made it a point that I was just going to refuse to argue and debate some things. Number one, I refuse to debate a mask. I'm not doing it. What I may choose to do or what you may choose to do, that can be a personal choice, but I am not going to cause a problem in the Lord's church over a piece of cloth. And if somebody feels more comfortable with me doing something in a certain way, especially in a way that may make them feel more secure, I'm going to do it. If we needed to wear bubble wrap to make everybody feel comfortable, I would be investing in bubble wrap. I'm not going to argue that. Decided I'm not going to argue politics. Not going to do it. Yeah, I know there's a lot of big issues, a lot of things that need to be discussed and some things that are maybe haywire in many ways. But at the same time, some things are just more important than others. And I'm not going to contribute to the conflict in society. Vaccines. Medicine. Here we go. Now they're coming out. And let everybody make their own decision. And I'm not saying these things aren't important. But when you're in a pestilence, and it's one right after another, Amos had one message. Because one message is more important than all the others. And that is seek the Lord and live. And it was at that moment that it hit me. If there was ever a time for Christians to show the world that they're truly different, this is it. To show the world the one in whom we truly trust. Who is our real king? Who is it that we honor above all else? Because we, like Amos, have been called to preach in a land that is not our home. 
in Hebrews chapter 11 and in verses 13 to 16. Remember what it said? They were longing for a better country. They were longing for a heavenly one whose builder and maker is God. And he's not ashamed to be called their God. Amos. What a prophet. And you know what's interesting? When you get over to the very end of Amos, in Amos chapter 9, although God gave him so many challenging sermons that he had to share with people who were not willing to listen, God did give him this message. It's a message that would actually be repeated many, many years later by those who had gathered in Jerusalem to resolve a huge issue of the day. They're going to quote, James is actually going to quote Amos in Acts 15. And what is he quoting him? Verse 11 of Amos 9. It says, In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen. I will repair its breaches. I will raise up its ruins. And I will rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. Amos, I'm going to ask you to preach a hard sermon, but people need to hear it. We all need to humble ourselves. But there's one coming who's going to draw all nations to himself. From David. It's Jesus. Jesus, the one who truly stood in the breach, the one who makes it possible for all of us to not just seek the Lord, but to live. So how do you live in a pestilence? (laughs) How do you live in uncharted territories? Well, maybe we just look to the example of Amos. Do what he did. And just maybe, just maybe at the end of the day, it will not only enrich us, but because we've been pushed out of our comfort zones just a little bit, the Lord gives us the opportunity to help enrich the lives of others. Tonight, if you're in this audience, I would hope maybe you're thinking about your life a little bit. Is the Lord actually speaking to me in all this? Is, is he trying to get my attention? Well, I believe he is every day in everything that he does. But if you're ready to respond to him, he's ready to receive you. Because what the Lord longs for more than anything else is our fellowship with him. And tonight you can come to him to respond to him. To have all your sins washed away because at the end of the day, there's only one thing that's important. If I can quote another Bowman. Anybody know where I'm headed with this? If you miss heaven, you've just missed all there is. That's what Amos wanted people to get. And if we can help you, Get there as well through our Lord Jesus Christ. Won't you come while we stand and sing? Jesus, the loving shepherd.